Okay, so in this video, I'm going to be going over the Unit 6 FRQ packet examples. Um, this is uh, the first question is going to be number four from 2018. I'll give you a moment to pause and read it if you need to and work the problem. Okay, so this is number 4C um, is asking for a trapezoidal sum. And so just let's recall real quick from your study guide, the area of a trapezoid is always going to be one half uh, times base one plus base two times the height. I think I might have written it divided by two on your packet. Uh, but this is the general formula for a trapezoid. And uh, keep in mind that your bases of your trapezoid are the heights um, or the y value for each coordinate. And your h is going to be the distance in between your independent variable coordinates here. Okay, so um, we need to find uh, the trapezoidal sum with four subintervals. This is really important because it may ask for a particular um, number of subintervals, which may not include all of the points. This one, however, says four subintervals. So that means we're going to use all of our coordinates because these five coordinates make up all the sides of the trapezoids throughout this, um, throughout these four subintervals here. Um, and uh, so we just start, um, you can just write out um, uh, with an integral because we're approximating the area. Um, we can put from two to 10 of h of t dt. Okay, we're not getting the exact value, so I'm not gonna put equals. You can just put the squiggly equal sign here to indicate that you're estimating this using a um, uh, Riemann sum. So I'm gonna just start with the first term. I got a one half, and what I'm gonna do is since every single time I do a trapezoid, I'm gonna multiply by a half, I'm just gonna leave this half out in front. And I'm gonna put big parentheses here. So that means I'm, I'm factoring out this one half, so I have less one halves to write throughout this entire thing. Okay, so I have one half, and now I'm gonna do base one plus base two. So this is gonna be uh, 1.5 plus two, uh, not divided by, but times the height. So I got 1.5 plus two times the height of the first trapezoid. The height of the first trapezoid is three minus two, which is just a one. Okay, then I go into the next trapezoid. Now the next trapezoid, you don't jump to two new coordinates, you're sharing a coordinate because all these trapezoids are um, all uh, standing right next to each other and they're sharing a coordinate in between them. So this two that was used right here is gonna get reused in the next trapezoid as well. So the next trapezoid is gonna be two plus the next coordinate, two plus six, multiplied by the difference in the x values, five minus three, which is two. Okay, and just like that, I can continue to find the area of these trapezoids. 11 plus 15 times 10 minus seven is three. So there's the end of my uh, trapezoids. Notice how the number of terms that I have uh, matches up with the number of subintervals that I have. So one, two, three, and four subintervals for trapezoids. Um, this one half was factored out from every single trapezoid. Um, and since this is a numeric expression right here, you can leave it like this. Don't waste time typing it into your calculator because um, this year you're on kind of a time crunch. We don't know what the AP test is going to look like or how long it might take you to do a particular part. You don't need to waste time calculating the exact value. If it's a numerical expression just like this, all numbers and values, even if there's addition and subtraction in between there, um, you can leave that just the way it is. And that's completely acceptable, okay? So that's number four from 2018. Okay, let's move on. This is number three from the 2017 test. Um, <clears throat> I'll give you a moment to read it and work it if you need to, just go ahead and pause it. Okay, so this was part A, where we have to find the values of f of negative six and f of five. Okay, this figure is showing us the graph of f prime. And so we need to use this graph to kind of get back to the original. So this is unit six, unit six is all about integration. So um, 
I can use integration to get from the derivative back to the original. So if I integrate f prime of x dx, then that will take me back to the original function, just regular f of x plus c. If it's an indefinite negro, if I don't know my bounds, I need to put this plus c here. But we can apply the definite integral to try to figure out what f of negative 6 is and what f of 5 is. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to erase this general integral here. And I'm going to rewrite it. So I'm going to say that um, I still have this f prime of x dx that I'm integrating. But now I need to figure out what bounds can I put here. Because when I use bounds, I can evaluate the antiderivative at those two bounds to figure out the definite integral. So a key important piece of information that I have here is this coordinate right here. f of negative 2 is equal to 7. So I'm going to use this as one of my bounds. This negative 2x value is one of my bounds. And if I want to figure out negative 6, f of negative 6, I'll put negative 2 as the top bound, and I'll put negative 6 as the bottom bound. The reason I'm doing this is because when I anti-derive, I get the original function f, and since I have a definite integral, I plug in a negative 2, I subtract, and I plug in f of, uh, I plug in a negative 6 into the function f. The reason I'm doing this is because I can now isolate f of negative 6 here. So I'm going to rewrite this step here and say that f of negative 6 is equal to, and if I wanted to rearrange this entire equation, I would have added f of negative 6 to this side, and I would have subtracted this integral this way. So I would now have f of negative 2 minus the integral from negative 6 to negative 2, f prime of x dx. So now you might be wondering, how the heck am I supposed to integrate this function f prime if I don't know what the equation is for it? Well, you don't need to. You know the graph right here. Another way we can interpret the integral here is the area under the curve between the bounds. So I don't know what f of negative 6 is. I do know what f of negative 2 is. It's 7. So I'm going to go ahead and replace that 7 in right here. 7 minus... And to figure out this guy right here, I just need to find the area under the curve from negative 6 to negative 2. So that is essentially going to be this area right here of this triangle in between there, negative 6 to negative 2. And this is a triangle. I don't need to use calculus. This is just pure geometry here. Um, it's going to be 1 half times the base times the height. So the base is 4, the height is 2, 4 times 2 is 8, 1 half of that is 4. So I put a 4 right there, 7 minus 4. So this is pretty straightforward now. f of negative 6 is equal to 7 minus 4 equals 3. There you go. There's f of negative 6. Okay, now I can apply the same um, idea to find f of 5. My integral will look a little bit different in terms of its bounds, but I'm still integrating f prime. So I'm going to put that same integral here again, f prime of x dx integrated. Now I want to find uh, f of 5, and I still am going to use negative 2 here, but this time, since negative 2 is less than 5, I'm going to use negative 2 as my bottom bound. I always want to put the lesser of the two bounds at the bottom. Here I put negative 6 at the bottom because it's less than negative 2. Here I'm putting negative 2 at the bottom because it's less than this 5 right here. All right, there we go. So now I have that this will be equal to the antiderivative f evaluated at 5 minus f evaluated at negative 2. Okay, there we go. Okay, once again I want to isolate f of 5. And all I have to do here is add f of negative 2 to this side. So really, I'm keeping this integral and just adding f of 2 to it. 
So here I'm going to have the integral from negative 2 to 5 of f prime of 5 plus f of negative 2. There we go. And I'm going to continue this line of work. I'm running out of space, but that's okay. Um, the area, oops, I forgot to write dx in there, dx. The area under this curve from negative 2 to 5 now is what I need to find. From negative 2 all the way up until 5. So here, I'm going to highlight this guy red because it's below the curve. It's going to take on a negative value of whatever that area is. But then I have another area that's this triangle that's above the x-axis here. So over here off to the side, I'm just going to calculate the area. So the area of that semicircle is one half of a circle, which is one half pi r squared. And since it's below the curve, I'm going to apply a negative to it. So I have negative one half pi times the radius of that circle. If it was a full circle, the radius would be a two. So one half times two squared, which is uh, four divided by two. So this is going to be a negative two pi right there, this area. And it's negative because it's below the x-axis. Now we need to find the area of this triangle right here. This triangle is above the x-axis, it's one half times the base, which is three, times the height, which is two. Three times two, which is six. So the area of that guy is a three. So now the in total, this integral right here, the value of that integral is both of these two guys combined. Okay, so now once again, um, all the problems on the AP test, you don't need a calculator to do them. They write the problems, they design them such that you don't need a calculator. Um, so you could leave your answer in terms, uh, you don't have to really simplify this 3 minus uh, 2 pi, you don't have to combine that specifically or exactly. I can just write that the area from negative 2 to 5 is positive 3 minus 2 pi. So I'm going to put that right here, positive 3 minus 2 pi. And then I'm going to have plus f of negative 2. Now we know from before f of negative 2 is the, still the same coordinate 7. So I'm still going to have this plus 7 right here. So that leaves me that f of 5 is equal to 3 minus 2 pi plus 7. You can leave it like this or you can simplify it by adding that 7 to the 3, whatever you want. But I would recommend to save your time. Um, literally every second matters on this test. A second that you're not writing could be a second that you're reading the next part. So I would just leave it like that. Okay, let's keep going. This is number 2016, uh, part C from number 6. Okay, this problem uh, gives us this uh, table here of values. And along the top we see we have f and f prime, g and g prime. And it gives us some x values and then the coordinates for those x values. So this part C is asking us to evaluate the integral from 1 to 3 of f double prime of two, uh, 2x dx. Okay, so what I need to do here is I need to think kind of conceptually about how would I integrate this. If it was just a regular x inside of here, I'll write it off to the side. If I had the integral of f double prime of x dx, the antiderivative would just be the first derivative, f prime of x, and then I would put a plus c, just like that. But now right here, we have a 2x instead of just an x inside of here. So whenever we did integration problems, I always asked, do you see something other than just an x in this function? Is there just a single x in there or is it something else? Um, I usually called it garbage because it's extra stuff that we don't really want to have to do anything with, but we're forced to. So we have this garbage inside of here and we want to cleanly evaluate this. Uh, this integral. What we use to evaluate or uh, solve an integral with this garbage inside of it was we used u substitution. Okay, so 
this is a u substitution problem where u is equal to 2x. You might have seen something similar in delta math as well. So right here, u is equal to 2x, which means du is equal to 2dx. We take the derivative of 2x, which is a regular 2, and we put on that dx. And this tells me that dx is equal to du over 2. So now I need to take um, this stuff and I need to replace it in back to this integral right here. So I'm going to put that this integral, I'll use a new color, is equal to the integral of f double prime of u and then I have a du over 2 right there. I substitute all my x's in for um, things with u in it. Since I did that I also need to substitute my bounds of integration. So instead of 1 and 3, I would put these guys into this right here, u equals 2x. So my bottom bound would be 2 times 1, which is a 2. And my top bound would be 2 times 3, which is 6. All right. Let's keep going. Now we just need to integrate this <clears throat> just as normal. So when I anti-derive f double prime of u, that, bit tell, uh, that gives me um, f with just one prime, uh, the first derivative, and that is evaluated at uh, 6 minus f prime evaluated at 2. <clears throat> Okay, so now you might be thinking, what happened to this divided by 2 here? Well, it's a constant. It's a divided by 2. So what I could actually do is I could take it all the way out to the front. And I'm going to put this 1 half over here out to the front. Okay, so now what I need to do is I need to go back up to my table. I have no idea what the, uh, what the heck these guys are. <laughs> so um, I need to go into my table and just match up these values. f prime of 6 is a 5. f prime of 6, there you go, 5. So I'll have equals 1 half times 5 minus, now I need to find f prime of 2. f prime of 2 is a negative 2. So minus a negative 2 right there. Okay, so right here, um, let me uh, fix that real quick bracket. Okay, right here we have a numerical expression. Once again, just as usual, like I've mentioned in the previous two problems, there's nothing wrong with leaving your answer like that. It's a numerical expression um, and is 100% acceptable and correct because let's say for instance you were kind of in a rush and on any test most of the mistakes people make are very simple errors and you're just thinking so hard about the problem that you forgot to, you forget to do the basics correctly. And let's say that you um, simplified uh, this guy, you got this step correct, but then you wrote equals, and then you wrote this to be equal to three because you just overlooked the extra negative and said five minus two is three. Um, and you wrote that down as your next step, that would be counted against you, you wouldn't get credit for getting the correct answer. You'd get credit for this stuff up here, but you wouldn't get credit for that last point that gets you the answer right. Okay, uh, that, that last point for getting the answer right. So that's why it's recommended that you stop right here to avoid yourself uh, making a simple mistake. Now, I mean, if you didn't make a mistake though, you would get seven over two. But if you did make a mistake, you probably would have gotten 3 over 2 because you didn't see that extra negative there. Okay, moving on. This is 2017 number 1. All right, this is another Riemann sum. The first problem we did earlier was a trapezoidal sum. This is a left-hand Riemann sum. All right, so um, we have this nice table up here of values. It's asking us for a left-hand Riemann sum with three subintervals. Okay, three subintervals means we have to have three terms in our expression. So what I'm going to do here is, so I'm going to write the integral. We want to approximate the volume uh, of the tank. So I'm going to integrate from 0 to 10, because the tank has a height of 10 feet. 
and I'm integrating a of h dh and I'm approximating it using a Riemann sum. So I'm going to use the squiggly equal sign here because my answer won't be exact. It's just based on the coordinates in the table. So um, you're, we're using three subintervals here. And since I'm using the left Riemann sum, I'm going to be using the first point because that's on the left side of each interval. So if I think about this as a number line, 0, 2, 5, and 10, and I think about these line segments, the left-hand Riemann sum is using the left endpoint of each segment. So if I'm going to use a different color for each segment, this is the first segment, the first subinterval. The second subinterval is 2 to 5, and the third subinterval is 5 to 10. So I need to use the left-hand side of each of these three different colored subintervals. So the left-hand side of this first green interval is 0, the left. So what I'm going to do here is think about if this is a rectangle, the base of it is 2, 0 to 2, and the height it would be using the coordinate for the left-hand coordinate of this interval, 0 to uh, the height would be 50.3. So base times height, 2 times 50.3. That's the first rectangle. Um, let me use green there so that it doesn't get confusing when I write it out. I got base times height 2 times 50.3 and now I'm going to add the next rectangle the base is 3 here 2 to 5 is 3 units and the height is going to be 14.4 because now this is the second sub interval if I'm just focused on this interval from 2 to 5 the height I would be using for a left-hand Riemann sum, I would be using the left endpoint of that particular segment, 14.4. That's where I got that from. And now the last rectangle, since I have three subintervals, I'm on my third term now, which means I'm on my last um, subinterval. Base is 5 times the height is 6.5. All right. Um, now, this was a calculator question. Um, so uh, on that test, students were able to just type this in and put equals. Um, but since this year you're not required, um, I would just say leave it like that once again. It's an expression. But okay, this is where students may lose that extra point. Indicate units of, uh, of measure. So um, if A of h is measured in square feet and saying the function um, uh, the tank has a height of 10 feet <clears throat> the area of um, the horizontal cross section of the tank at h feet is given by function so we're everywhere I see feet here um, but when I take the area under the curve that value is giving me a measurement of the volume. So I need to think about what the volume of whatever's in this tank um, would have to be measured in. So it wouldn't just be feet. Whenever we think of volume, we think of third dimension, the cubic feet, feet cubed here. So that would give me another point right there, cubic feet. All right. This is 2012, number four. Okay, it gives me this function. Part D is asking me to find the value of this integral right here. All right, so when I look here, I see x is in a couple of different locations. It's out in front of the square root. It's inside the square root. There's two different places where it is. So if I try a basic um, anti-deriving, you know, reverse power rule type of thing, it's going to be a little confusing because I have this square root here and there's an x on the outside and there's x squared on the inside. What I do recognize here though is those two terms are related in a special way. x squared, if I take its derivative I get 2x and in its derivative 2x and x shows up. So this is kind of indicating to me, signaling to me, hey this is a u substitution problem. What I'm going to do is I'm going to set u to be equal to whatever is under the square root, 25 minus x squared. du should be equal to 
If I take the derivative of 25, that's 0. The derivative of negative x squared is negative 2x. And then I got a dx. I can rearrange this to make dx be equal to du over negative 2x. <clears throat> okay, so what I now need to do is rewrite this integral here. So I have the integral. I had an x outside, but then I changed the square root of u, uh, square root of 25 minus x squared to be the square root of u. And dx instead can be du over negative 2x. Okay, and before I move further, I'm also going to rewrite in, whoops, I'm going to rewrite in my two bounds, but they're not going to be 0 and 5. They're going to be, if I plug in a 0 here, it's going to be 25 for my lower bound, 25 minus 0 squared. For my upper bound, uh, 25, 5 squared is 25. 25 minus 25 is 0. This is not a mistake. This is the way it's supposed to be done. Um, it may look a little confusing because you got 0 and 25 kind of in the wrong spots, but um, just trust the process and keep moving forward. Okay, let's simplify our uh, integrand here. So I have the integral from 25 to 0 of the square root of u du. Now I'm going to rewrite the square root of u as u to the 1 half du like this. Okay, now we can anti-derive. Easy reverse power rule integration here. So it's going to be u to the 3 halves divided by 3 halves or you can put a 2 thirds in front. Either way works. And when I do this, I'm evaluating from 25 to 0. Okay, so don't worry about the mathematic, uh, the arithmetic here of multiplying, simplifying, all that stuff. You can leave it after this, after this next step, you can be able to leave it like that. So 2 thirds, 0 to the 3 halves, uh, not plus, sorry, minus. And then I'm going to have 2 thirds 25 to the 3 halves. This is completely a numerical expression. If you wanted to, you could even cross this guy out. But I would just leave it like that because you have this minus sign right here. I would just leave it like that. It's a numerical expression. It's the correct answer. So I would just leave it like that. Don't waste any more time on it. Use your time wisely on this test. Okay, number three from 2019. Um, this one, I did forget to include another graph um, of this. Um, oh, no, I didn't. It's right here. Okay, we're good. Um, this is part C. We need to find the absolute maximum value of g on the interval. So first thing, this is actually something from unit 2 slash 3, uh, no sorry, unit 4 slash 5. Whenever you have an absolute maximum or a minimum, you may have noticed on the previous examples in that video, I wrote check endpoints whenever you had an absolute minimum or maximum. So the same thing holds here. Anytime you see that word absolute, Okay, absolute maximum or absolute minimum. Um, you need to check your endpoints. And those are these two guys right here, negative two and five. I also need to check when does my first derivative equal zero. So the absolute maximum of G could happen at a critical number. A critical number is when the first derivative equals zero. So in this case, the equation here is an integrally defined function. So if I need to take the in, uh, derivative of this guy right here, I'm applying the second fundamental theorem of calculus, which says that I just drop x into, into this variable here. So g prime of x is equal to f of x. And I need to see when does this guy equal 0. If I look at my graph, in order to see when g prime is 0, I need to look at when f itself is zero. So let's take a look at this graph down here. 
This is the graph of f. I have two points where f is equal to zero. It happens that x equals negative one, and it happens that x equals one half. So these are what are called my critical numbers. All right, and my endpoints are over here, negative two and five. So what I need to do here is I need to evaluate these four points. X equals negative two, five, negative one, and one half. I need to evaluate those by plugging them back into the original function because I want to find when does G have the highest level, the highest value. It could occur at the endpoints or it could occur at the critical points. Which of these four gives us the highest Y value? Uh, for g of x. So what I need to do is create a little list here, g of negative 2 equals g of, I'll go in order, negative 1 equals g of 1 half equals and g of 5 equals. So I need to figure out what are the values for these um, five, these four points right here. So I need to plug negative two in starting off here into this function right here. So if I think about this, I'm gonna write out this integral from negative two to negative two f of t dt. Okay, so this guy right here, you may be confused by this for two reasons. One, because the bounds are the same and two, because you don't have an equation for f of t, that's okay. You have this guy right here. So you wanna find the area under this curve. Interpret it visually or graphically here. If I integrate between the same point from negative two to negative two and I haven't gone anywhere, then I haven't taken any area. So this value is a zero. Okay, and I can keep continuing to evaluate these points. So I'm gonna do the same thing. I'll use a different color. I'm going from negative two to negative one this time because I'm replacing the x bound, upper bound with the x value here that I'm evaluating, negative one. f of t dt equals, so now I look from negative two to negative one. Okay, this is this little triangle slice right here that's above the x-axis. That's one half base times height, so one half, one times one, which is just a half. All right, let's keep going. Uh, I'm running out of space, so let me erase these guys real quick g of one half is equal to the integral from negative two to one half f of t dt. Okay, that's gonna be all the way from this starting point, negative two, all the way up until the half. So it's including this triangle above the x-axis, but it's also taking the area of this triangle below the x-axis, which is gonna be a negative area. So um, I've already figured out that this guy above here is one half. Below here, the area of that is one half base times height. The base is three halves. So one half times three halves is three fourths times the height negative one. So this is a negative three fourths down here. Okay, negative three fourths. So the area in total from negative two to one half is one half minus three fourths. Um, and one half minus three fourths is just negative one fourth. So I get a negative one fourth for this guy. And lastly, we need to find G of five. So this is the area from negative two to five, F of T DT. Okay, now this is including all of the area from the beginning to the end. So I'm gonna kind of break this up into sections. I've already taken care of this first part, one half minus three fourths. So up until this point, one half right here, I know the area is negative one fourth. I need to figure out the area of this weird looking shape here. So if I break it up into two different sections, I'm gonna highlight this triangle right here, okay? And I'm gonna highlight this curved piece right here. And if you notice, this is a quarter circle right here, this white space out here. And this is the space outside of that quarter circle if the exterior was like a square or you know a right angle corner. So this green space right here, 
its area is going to be one half times the base times the height. So the height here is three and the base is going to be um, three halves. So here, this guy ends up being nine fourths. Nine over four. Okay, now if I take a look at this purple piece, if I take the area of the square, it's nine. But I'm not taking the area of this white stuff, I'm taking the area of this stuff out here. So it's actually gonna be the square minus the white space, which will give me this uh, purple space that I've shaded here. So I have nine minus, and this looks like a quarter, it is a quarter circle. Um, and if I do a quarter circle, that's one fourth pi r squared. And now here r is three. One, two, three units, three squared. So times nine. So that will be nine minus one fourth pi times nine. So here what I'm gonna end up doing is I'm gonna write out my entire expression for the area. I have negative one fourth for this first two triangles right here. And then I'm gonna do plus these guys over here, plus the nine fourths of the green triangle, plus the nine minus nine fourths pi for that guy right there. And this is a numerical expression and it is the greatest value out of these three here. This is the largest value, so this therefore is your absolute maximum. All right, the next problem, this is a BC only problem, okay? And in particular, this is a problem about partial fractions. Integration by partial fractions. This is um, part D of number five from 2015. It gives us this arbitrary function here with this K in there. K is some non-zero constant. For part D, it says let K equal six. So here's your new function now. Um, and it says find the partial fraction decomposition for this function and find the integral of f of x. So a partial fraction decomposition is what I showed you in class. It's those two fractions with a over the denominator plus b over the other denominator. So right here, the decomposition, I need to first start by factoring x squared minus 6x. So that becomes x times x minus 6. These are my two factors here. I can factor out an x. So now my decomposition, instead of one over x squared minus six x, this becomes a over x plus b over x minus six dx. This is the decomposition here. But in order to fully decompose it, I need to figure out what a and b both are. A, um, well, before I first talk about A and B, I first need to write down the solutions here. This is called the heavy side method to figure out A and B. So for X equals zero, I wrote that because it's the solution for this X right here. And then X minus six, its solution is a positive six. So what I need to do right here is I need to do the heavy side method, which was covering something up. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is over here up at the top, I'm gonna write one over x times x minus six, just like that. All right, so, and I'm gonna draw this really small rectangle and I'm gonna cover up the x. So since I'm covering up the x, I need to, that's, that means I'm figuring out the a value here. So I covered up the x, and I need to plug in the solution for that term as well into the other term. So if I covered up the x, I plug in a zero into the other factor, and I get one over negative six. So that's gonna be a. So instead of a, I'm gonna put negative one over six. 
And then for b, I do the same thing, except I just cover up the x minus 6. So I covered up the x minus 6. I need to plug in a 6 into the other factor, which is an x. So this becomes 1 over 6, positive 1 over 6. So now I've decomposed this, uh, this partial fraction here. So now I need to rewrite my integral cleanly. I can do, this is negative 1 sixth over x plus positive 1 sixth over x minus 6 dx. Okay, now I can just integrate this. You can leave your numerators as fractions, completely fine. You don't need to rewrite that um, entire fraction here. Just leave this numerator like that. Whenever I had something over x or something over x plus or minus a constant, um, I'm essentially using this as a fact uh, as a constant I can factor out the numerator. That leaves me a one over x. The antiderivative of one over x is a natural log absolute values of the denominator, and I can put that constant negative one sixth out in front. Plus, and I do the same thing for the other factor. Uh, the other term, 1 sixth natural log of x minus 6. Now I can do this here because this is a single x right here. But if it was like 2x or 3x or some other um, uh, x with a uh, coefficient other than 1, I would have to divide by that coefficient on the outside. Okay, And since this is a general antiderivative, it's, not, it's an indefinite integral, I need to add on, t tack on that plus c. Okay, there you go. There is the antiderivative here, and that's all there is to it. All right, this is the last page. These are also BC only problems. This one is an integration by parts problem. <clears throat> Use anti-differentiation to find f of x. Gives you some information, but it gives you f prime of x. In order to get to the original, I need to anti-derive. So if I need to anti-derive f prime of x dx, that's the same thing as anti-deriving x squared natural log of x dx. Okay, so on your study guide, the latter is i late. And the higher up it is, that's your u and your lower term is the dv. So here I see x squared, which is algebraic, and I see a natural log, which is higher up. So right here, my u is going to be natural log of x, and my dv will be x squared dx. And now what I need to do is I need to derive u to get du, so du ends up being 1 over x dx, and I need to anti-derive my dv to get the original v. Uh, reverse power rule, so this will be 1 third x cubed. So I have all my elements here. Now what I need to do is go back and replace them. So on your formula chart, we know it's uv minus the integral of v du. So I'll put equals u times v, so I have one-third x cubed times natural log of x. So there's uv, uv minus the integral of v, which is one-third x cubed du, which is one over x dx, one over x dx. All right, I'm going to continue to simplify this. This first term right here um, can stay as is. It's already integrated. One third x cubed natural log of x minus, now I need to clean this guy up before I integrate it. If I had an x cubed and an x, that's like x cubed divided by x, I end up with an x squared. So over here off to the side, I'll put that this is equal to one third x squared dx. So now I can anti-derive that cleanly uh, using the reverse power rule. So I just add 1 to the exponent and I divide. So this becomes 1 over 9 x cubed. I initially had a 1 third, 
I add an exponent to make it x cubed and divide by a 3. So 3 times 3 in the denominator makes that a 9 plus c. There's my antiderivative. All right, last question. <clears throat> we need to find the value of f of 3. And we're given this function here and this coordinate right here. This coordinate is essential to solving this problem. I know that the integral of f prime of x dx um, is equal to the original. But since I want to find a particular coordinate a particular at a particular point, 3, I'm going to use 3 as my top bound, and I'm going to use my known coordinate 1 as the bottom bound, 1 to 3. I always want my numbers in order. Bottom bound should be less than the top bound, 1 to 3. So I know this is going to be f of 3 minus f of 1. Okay, but I still need to use this function right here to figure this guy out. So before I write down this right here, I know conceptually that's what it's going to be, f of 3 minus f of 1. I need to first figure out what f is, uh, what the original function is. So I'm going to rewrite this integral, 1 to 3, x minus 3 times e to the x. Okay, so if I try all my different methods, I try regular anti-differentiation, uh, anti um, I try u substitution, it doesn't work, it's not partial fractions, it's got to be the last method that we know, which is integration by parts. Okay, once again, ilate. Um, ilate is easy to identify when you have an e to the x, okay? e is all the way at the bottom, so that's got to be my dx, uh, my dv. So here at the bottom, I'll put u is x minus 3 dv is e to the x. And if you get confused on a test and it doesn't work, just flip them and um, if you feel like you got them confused, mix them up, then try it the other way, put e to the x there and x minus 3 there. But this ends up being du is equal to 1 dx or just dx. v is equal to e to the x. The antiderivative of e to the x is just e to the x. Alright, let's keep going. So I got uv e to the x times x minus 3 minus the integral of v du. Well, v is e to the x and du is just dx. Okay, so when I have bounds right here, I need to evaluate everything from 1 to 3. So that first term and that second term from 1 to 3. But since I haven't finished up my integration yet, I'm going to keep going, and then at the end, I'll um, evaluate my bounds. Um, so I still leave e to the x times x minus 3 here, minus, and the antiderivative of e to the x is just an e to the x. Um, let me do something just so there's no technical issues here. I'll put a 1 to 3 there and a 1 to 3 there. How about that? Okay, it's still doing the same thing. I just want to make sure it stays equivalent and you don't lose points in here for losing those bounds of integration. Okay, so I anti-derived. Now I can put 1 to 3 all the way on the outside of here. Just like that. All right, let's finish up this problem. e to the 3 times 0, what I'm doing is plugging in a 3. e to the 3 times 3 minus 3, which is 0, minus e to the 3, minus the bottom bound plugged in, e to the 1 times 1 minus 3, which is negative 2, minus e to the 1. Okay, so let's um, take a pause right here. You could continue to simplify this, or you could just leave it the way it is because it's a numerical expression. It's in terms of e. You could leave it like that. Same thing goes for natural log, cosine, all that stuff. Numerical expression, you can leave it the way it is.
Um, but if you did continue to simplify this, this guy would um, be just a negative e to the 3. Um, and then you can multiply this negative to the inside and simplify it down. But I would just leave it like this and call it a day. All right. As always, please email me if you have questions or if you need me to work other examples. Um, yeah, if you have questions, let me know.